Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna talk about um, quants and careers. It's gonna be kind of a two-part video here. Uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the history, then we're gonna talk about the job market, and then we're gonna kind of talk about the future of the job market and my final advice for those looking to get into quantitative finance. So just to start off, derivative products as an entire category has been around for like I guess hundreds if not thousands of years. It's been back in like Roman times, Egyptian times, like Mesopotamia. Um, it's just something that's been around. So it's not something new, uh, but in like 1900, Louis Bachier, Bachier, I don't know, French name, uh, he actually wrote this paper and is working on how to price uh, equity, derivative contracts or something such as a European option. And then he passed away and the paper never really got finished and nothing really came out of it. And then uh, Paul Samuelson, I believe, so from, he's huge in finance, you can Google him. Uh, he found this paper, he had it translated, he brought it back to the US and then everybody was in this mad frantic dash because derivatives were still being traded and used, but there's no really easy way to price them and it was this big challenge on how do you price uh, derivative products. And then in 1973, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes um, created the Black Scholes model. The reason it's so groundbreaking and amazing is that it actually has a closed form solution um, to price European options and it can be used to price American options and a lot of the theory and understanding. So now when you add in Merton, so Robert Merton on uh, expanding the understanding of the mathematical equations behind all these derivatives, um, really allows us to price a variety of things from fixed income to like forwards, futures, swaps. Like you can price everything with a lot of the mathematics behind this and the understanding. And then I wanna kind of point out here that probably in like the 80s, I would say, again, I'm not a historian or anything, but you read books like by Emmanuel Derman, um, he talks a lot about the word quant. So the word quant, was really born out of this era of these mathematicians like working at a variety of banks, such as Goldman Sachs, for example, and they came out and they're working, they're doing a lot of math, they're working on derivative pricing, like new strategies, everything is changing as, you know, options were really playing a larger part in the derivatives market. And they were using these ex-scientists to come in, do research, use mathematics and scientific techniques and apply these um, to derivative products. And so the term quant was coined for those that were actually financial engineers uh, doing sell sides. You were creating the derivative products that were being sold um, to other people, to the buy side, right? And so this all started this connotation of quant. It was given to them by a lot of the management and finance professionals as a very derogatory term. Um, and it was applied to them and that's where it started. And then over time it started expanding and the buy side started gaining more quants. And so they had to actually price these. So if you don't know, sell side creates the products and sells them. Um, buy side is those that are going to actually buy them as an investment or a way to make money. So these are hedge funds, retirement funds, mutual funds. Anyone who's buying assets is gonna be on the buy side. Those that are selling on the sell side. And so these both started doing a lot of derivative product work. And so then the quant term kind of expanded to that. Um, and then something else to note is in 1994, um, Carnegie Mellon, so CMU, they created the first financial engineering program that was focused on financial engineering as a field. And then it took off. And then later down the road, more and more programs started up. And then I would say probably 2015 was an explosion of nonsense, fake financial engineering product or programs. And so there's a lot of these fake quants running around claiming to be financial engineers, but not having the education rigor and background, especially compared to those that started the term um, way back in like the 80s and 90s, and now it's just kind of tarnished into nothing. So that's just the quick history on quant, what it is and where it really came from. And then just to kind of wrap this up here, so I'm gonna throw this little note on here. The reason that the word quant has been abused so much is that quants made really good money. They were viewed as very bright the later on in life as the word quant became more and more popular and the value was seen by the banks. And so everybody wanted to be a quant because you could make a lot of money if you were a quant. So everybody started saying, I'm a quant. So if you're a data business person, you would say, I'm a quant. And if you're like a data scientist now, they all say, oh, we're quants. Everybody tags that name on hoping that they can garnish that same high paying wage because of the amount of education and rigor you have, even though they don't have it. And like I mentioned, these fake financial engineering programs do not teach you the same rigor. And so when you start saying, I'm a quant, I have a financial engineering degree, I have a STEM degree, therefore I'm a quant, or I have a math degree, therefore I'm a quant, 
In my, my personal opinion, you are nowhere near a quant, um, but that's really where quant came from and that's why it's been diluted down to nothing. And this is actually happening with data scientists now, the first original data scientists from way back, again, doing analytics, very high-end, very mathematical, very heavy computer programming, similar to quants in many ways, but not the same. Um, their track of rigor and their expertise was worth a lot. And companies were willing to pay a lot of money for this. Now what's happened is that name has been tarnished as everybody is a data scientist now um, or a machine learning expert or artificial intelligence nonsense. So everybody dives on in here and claims the data science title and now those that were making you know, two, 300,000 a year, um, they're still making that, they're still very good, but the vast majority of companies looking for data scientists aren't really looking for data scientists, they're just analytics professionals. And at the same time, the salary for a data scientist used to be way up here, has came way down here. And this is essentially the exact same trend that happened with the quants. Um, data science is losing its meaning and it's just gonna go to the wayside um, in a similar fashion. So now let's talk about the job market here. So quants, I'm gonna view them as financial engineers, but more broadly as just financial quantitative analytics here. Um, so typically like risk management research, quantitative trading, things that are heavy in statistics and mathematical modeling, um, those not using Excel. Um, they were huge in 2005, six, seven, and partially into eight. And then when the crisis hit, um, as you can see on this chart here, uh, CDSs, so cr credit default swaps, as well as like other types of derivative products like equities here, they spiked around 2007, 2008 the crises hit and it tanked. So all these quants that were needed to actually do the sell side to create these derivatives or those on the buy side who are actually going to be pricing these derivatives and buying them um, for a profit and then reselling them again in a way to profit off of this product. Um, that was no longer needed in 2009, 2010, 2011. The market burst, there was not as many derivatives in the market, they're not being traded as much and due to this is there's just not a high demand for financial engineers anymore. That being said, um, this follows through history after the crisis in 2010, CCAR and DFAS were implemented. Um, the Fed required all these large banks to do stress testing exercises on their capital based on specific scenarios given macroeconomic variables that were actually required to be put into models. Um, I would say this peaked around 2015, probably 2016 was right where the last peak was. And then after 2016, regulations have kind of slumped um, this year in 2018, uh, three banks, CIT, uh, Comerica, and Zions, I believe, all got dropped from CCAR. So again, now there's less banks doing CCAR, there's less demand for it. The Fed has like lowered the amount of regulation, and again, we don't use many people in risk management, which is part of quantitative finance. So where does this leave the job market in general? Um, this leaves it, I think, in a very stable kind of area. I've seen a lot of kind of dropout. Companies have been reducing. Um, in 2010, 11, 12, 13, and even through 14, there was a high demand for consultants to come in and help banks actually figure out how to implement these models. Because you had such tight time timelines, you really had to bring in a lot more people and doing consultants is very expensive. But if you only need them for six months to a year, two years, it ended up being three for some banks for, um, then they got rid of all these consultants, I think around 2017, 2016, again, when all these banks are starting to slump back off. And then again, 2018, we've leveled out here. So what does this mean for you if you're a student or if you're looking to get into the industry? Um, a, it's very, very hard to get in because there's not an abundance of jobs, okay? That's understandable. The pros with this though is the compensation's still very good. The when I say compensation too, I mean salary, benefits, ability to work from home or work remotely, like they treat us very, very well, at least in the banks that I've been at. So I've really enjoyed being in risk management, even though I came in like probably near the peak. Um, now it's slumping off, completely fine with that. This means that we have good job stability as well as good compensation. So while we're not hiring a bunch of people, there's also not this big rush to let go a lot of people because those have been let go probably over the last few years um, through natural people just quitting. Um, there's still a lot of the big banks are having some shuffle. So Citibank, you know, BOA, um, JP Morgan Chase, like all the big names are still shuffling employees here and there. People are moving up, but in general, I don't see a big demand for it anymore. But on the flip side, that means this industry is fairly stable. I can't see it sinking too much further than where it's at. 
So the last point here on the job market is going to be the cyclicality of it. So for those of you that don't know, so for students, you guys are going to apply in the spring. So like May, June is when you're going to be starting your jobs. So you need to be applying early, like November, December, January to get those jobs for the spring. That's when all these college grads are gonna come on. It's somewhat rare to bring people on in the winter. So like if you're bringing you on to start like in November, December, it's just not as common. Um, some schools will end up with a half semester. Yes, I went to a program that ended on a half semester. Um, I took a semester off in the middle and then made mine end on the actual timing, so mine was a little bit easier. But in general, students, you're gonna be coming in like May and June. So for everybody else out there who's actually like an industry professional, you're looking to jump around or you're gonna go from one industry into this, um, this is just basic career-wise for most people. Banks pay bonuses in March, which means your annual review is from January slash March um, through December of that year. Um, bonus eligibility for most bank ends in like August, September-ish, somewhere in there. So people that leave uh, between like August and January, February, that March, like they're not gonna be eligible for the bonus in that March. They're gonna have to wait an entire year to go around to come back. What that means is most people stay in their jobs um, between like August through March of the next year, whereas people that are looking for jobs in the boom in hiring, so if you're looking to change careers, uh, the time to do that is between March and July. That's the big hit. Every single year when recruiters come out of the woodwork, I always see them around March through July. Um, they're frantically looking like, oh, our clients need all these quants and risk management professionals come over to this bank, come over to that bank. Uh, we've got X, we've got Y, we'll make this thing great for you. Trust me, it's a great place to be. Um, so that's when the hiring boom is gonna happen. That's kind of the cyclicality of the hiring market and when to jump um, just because of the bonus structure of most banks. The third part of this video is gonna be the future here. So what do I see the future of quantitative finance being? Again, it's stabled out. So I don't see there being a lot of shifts, but that being said, um, intellectually, educationally, market-wise, banks are all definitely moving towards automation, which is one topic. And then the second topic is they're going to be moving towards machine learning and artificial intelligence. For those of you that don't know, especially students, banks have been using like decision trees for 20, 30 years now. This is nothing new. Data science isn't this new fun thing like a lot of you have discovered. Banks have been using decision trees for a long, 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 long time. It's not that new. Um, but a lot of banks are trying to implement these as well as like random forests, which is a little more advanced, uh, and neural networks into other applications and other areas of the bank. So this is where it's really expanding. So for example, credit risk, market risk, they typically have very specified specific markets, um, types of models, things that they use. Now they're somewhat exploring other options, looking for ways around this, looking for better methods, easier implementation, for example. And so Python and R kind of coming on the scene at different banks, such as like BOA, City. I know a lot of the big banks are looking at it. Um, but in general, most banks are starting to move that direction away from SaaS, but towards some of the newer languages and data science is going to be the new skill set to have. But that being said, if you're a data scientist and you don't have the statistics background and you don't have the math background, you don't have the programming background, you don't have the finance background, it's gonna be really, really hard to get in because these banks, I shouldn't say these banks, a lot of the big banks are hiring data scientists. Uh, Capital One, for example, hires a lot of data scientists, but other banks are still wanting people who are very traditionally trained that can do quant work. So financial engineering applications, statistical modeling, so you have a master's and PhD in statistics, uh, risk management is a great area for you to end up in, and even like in the research and trading realms, um, they're still looking for people very bright, very rigorous across the board. You can't be a specialist only in machine learning. I think that's kind of a nail in the coffin for many of you. If that's all you wanna do, finance is probably not the area for you to go into. There's not gonna be a lot of options career-wise. And then finally, my fourth kind of point here is my advice to you if you're a student or you're in another industry and you're looking to get into quantitative finance, if you do not eat, sleep, and breathe, if you do not absolutely love quantitative finance as an entire whole, meaning you don't love the mathematics, you don't love the computer programming, you don't love the finance, you don't love the statistics, like you have to love the entire package. If you are someone who is brilliant, you're a statistician and you hate programming, it's not gonna work for you. Um, seriously, go, go somewhere else, do statistics somewhere else, uh, be a consultant, do something very different. Um, if you love to program, you're a computer science major, you wanna do quantitative finance, and you just don't like math, you don't like the statistics side of it, 
this, this isn't gonna work for you either. Like this is not going to be a fit. Those that really succeed, that really do well, that make really good money because they're so like deep into the materials and they do this on their weekends. Like for example, I'm reading textbooks this weekend. Yeah, this is what we do. We're nerds, we're quants. Um, we eat, sleep, and breathe this. We love this. This is our lives. If you want to do this, this is a really hard route to get into, but if you put in the effort, you get the degrees, um, you get the work experience, you really drive hard, you network, you will be successful and it will pay very well at the end of the day by the time all is said and done. You'll easily make up the cost of your education and the time spent doing it. And then at the end of it, since you absolutely love this, uh, I think it's just a really, really big reward at the end here. I just absolutely love my job of doing statistics and risk management. So anyways, guys, that's kind of a summary of like the history of where quant came from, where the job market's sitting, where I see it going. If you like this video and found it helpful, don't forget to subscribe below. Give me a thumbs up or a like in the comments. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching. As always, until next time.